Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, or TOP. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Stephanie Gertali, a postdoctoral fellow at the Rutgers Institute for Nicotine and Tobacco Studies. TOPS is organized by C. Shang at The Ohio State University, Michael Darden at Johns Hopkins University, Jamie Hartman Boyce at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and Mike Pesco at the University of Missouri. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discuss it. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in the conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they're not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Si Shang from The Ohio State University to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our summer fall 2023 season with a single paper presentation by Manali Dolph entitled Flavored Tobacco Sales Restrictions and Teen E-Cigarette Use, Evidence from California. This presentation was selected via a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Melanie Dove is an assistant professor in the Public Health Sciences Department at the University of California, Davis. She obtained her master's in public health from Boston University and her doctorate from Harvard. Her research focuses on the impact tobacco control policies have on tobacco use among youth and young adults. She has examined the public health impact of uh, smoke-free air, air loss, tobacco 21 policies, and flavored tobacco sales restrictions. Dr. Dove also teaches an introduction to SARS course and is the PI of the Tobacco Control Evaluation Center at UC Davis. Our discussion today is Dr. Yingning Wang, Assistant Professor at the Institute for Health and Aging and the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Melanie Dove, thank you for presenting for us today. Great, thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction. So again, my name is Melanie Dove. I'm an assistant professor at UC Davis. And today I'll be talking to you about flavored tobacco sales restrictions and teen e-cigarette use in California. I don't have any, um, th this is my uh, funding source and no other funding related um, sources to disclose. So this talk is, um, based on this paper. And I just want to acknowledge my co-authors here, Kevin Gee and Eliza Tong. So this is an outline of my talk. First, I'll describe the background and aims and then the methods, and then I'll, I'll pause for questions and then go into the results, conclusions, uh, explanation of the results and some next steps. So flavored tobacco sales restrictions are policies that ban the sale of flavored tobacco at the retail store level. And these can be implemented in um, at the state level or at the city level or the county level. So this slide shows the, the impact of flavored tobacco sales restrictions, which I abbreviate here as FTSRs. Uh, this is from Rogers systematic review. And so um, there was moderate to strong quality evidence that flavor regulations reduce the sale and retail availability of tobacco products, but only moderate quality evidence that they were associated with a decreased use. And so this, our study will focus on um, access tobacco and initiation and use of tobacco. This chart shows the number of flavored tobacco policies passed by year over time from 2007 to 2022. And so we can see that most of them were passed in 2019. So that's also the, the year that we'll focus on for this study. 
And we can see that most of them have been at the local level, either at the city or the town level. And a few states um, listed are shown in yellow here have passed policies. So in particular in California, which um, we'll focus on in this talk, um, the almost 50% of the population was covered by a flavored tobacco sales restriction as of November uh, 2022. And we can see that most of these were concentrated in the Bay Area, um, which we'll also focus on in this talk. And uh, recently, just this uh, past December, uh, California banned the sale of flavored tobacco products at the state level. So the goal of our paper was to examine if local uh, flavored tobacco sales restrictions were associated with a change in e-cigarette use among high school students in California. And we also examined ease of access to e-cigarettes and use of an e-cigarette use of marijuana in an e-cigarette. Now I'll go into the methods. First, I'll talk about our data sources. So our main data source is the California Healthy Kids Survey. And we compared 2017-18 school year to the 2019-20 school year. And this was all, this data was all collected before COVID-19 related school closures. And the survey has a response rate of 75%. And uh, information on the city level uh, labor policies and dates came from the Public Health Law Center. And so uh, this data was also linked with um, uh, data from the California Department of Education to get information on the city and school size, the American Community Survey to get population density, and the uh, California Department of Tax and Fee Administration to get tobacco retailer data. And this chart um, shows our sample size. And so, um, we limited our analysis to uh, high school students in California in the Bay Area, and then we merged our data, um, our different data sources together, which reduced the sample size a little bit. And then we restricted the high school students that attended public high school, and they were not missing data on e-cigarette use, and they answered questions honestly. This was a, a question on the survey. And then we restricted the data to high schools that were both in the 1718 survey and the 1920 survey. So the same high school is in uh, both years, but different different students. And now I'll talk about the exposure. So students were considered exposed if they attended school in a city with a, a flavored tobacco sales restriction and unexposed that they attended school in a city without a restriction. So I just want to point out that exposure status is based on where the student attends school, not on their home address. So we only had the address of the school, not their home. And here's a map and it, uh, of the nine counties in the, the Bay Area that we included. And in the dark purple, are the, uh, the cities that were considered exposed that had a flavored tobacco sales restriction. Um, here we have San Francisco and Oakland. And then in light purple are cities that also had a flavored tobacco sales restriction, but didn't meet our criteria. So they were not included in our study. And the areas shaded in white are areas um, that didn't have a, a sales restriction. So um, let's see. So our, our main um, analysis had exposure as either you know with or without a uh, policy. So we did two sensitivity analysis to determine if exemptions matter. 
So some policies have exemptions, such as they um, they allow menthol flavor or they um, just prohibit sales um, sales of flavored tobacco near schools. So we wanted to see if these exemptions mattered. So in the first sensitivity analysis, we looked at comprehensive flavored tobacco sales restrictions, those without any exemptions uh, that banned um, all flavors from all locations compared to uh, flavored tobacco sales restrictions with an exemption or not exposed. And then we did a, another sensitivity analysis where we looked at comprehensive flavored tobacco sales restrictions versus um, just not being exposed. So here's a, a timeline. So we have uh, starting with the 1718 school year, the 1819 school year, and then the 1920 school year. So our flavor policies were all passed during the 1819 school year or the summer before or after. And you can see them listed here. The ones with little um, superscripts have exemptions. For example, Oakland, adult only stores were excluded. And the ones without superscripts were comprehensive. Um, and then so we compared the school year before, 1718, uh, e-cigarette the school year after, 1920. And these dates uh, I wanted to point out are uh, either enforcement or effective date. So now I'll talk about the outcomes. Our main outcome was current e-cigarette use, and it was asked um, using the following question during the past 30 days, and how many days did you use e-cigarettes? Uh, and so we looked, um, this was a two category variable. We compared uh, more than one day to zero days. We also looked at frequency of use where among current users, we compared um, 20 to 30 days as frequent use uh, compared to less than 20 days. We looked at access to e-cigarettes uh, through the question, how difficult it is for, is it for students in your grade to get any of the following if they really want them, big products. And so we compared very easy to the rest of the categories. And we also looked at ever or lifetime e-cigarette use and ever using marijuana in an e-cigarette. So now we'll talk about how the data was analyzed. Uh, we used a difference in difference analysis where we compare the pre to post policy change in exposed students to the same change in unexposed students. We used adjusted logistic regression models to get the difference in difference odds ratio, which we obtained uh, by including an interaction term between year and exposure group. And we used SAS survey procedures to account for the fact that students were clustered within schools. And we also tested for the parallel trends assumption. So we uh, tested this two ways. So first we looked at uh, just uh, graphically uh, using this figure. So we looked at the trends before policy and policy implementation in 1819 um, for the two outcomes of ever e-cigarette use and current e-cigarette use. And so we compared the trends um, uh, with a flavor restriction shown in the blue line, so without shown in the gray line. And just um, looking at the graph, we can see that the trends are fairly uh, uh, similar between the two groups. They kind of go down and then up and parallel here. And we also um, uh, used a logistic regression model to statistically test uh, whether or not the trends were different. So we did this by including an interaction term in logistic regression models for 
ever in current e-cigarette use, and we included data before policy implementation. We do not uh, test uh, the outcomes of marijuana use or ease of access to e-cigarettes because these questions weren't available until 2017, so we didn't really have data before policy implementation. And um, doing this test, we found that the, the p-value for the interaction term was greater than 0.05 for both of our outcomes, indicating the assumption held. Okay, so now I will pause for questions before going into the results. Thank you, Melanie. So let's turn uh, to our discussion today, Dr. Yuning Wang, to see whether she has any comments. Thank you. Thank you. And first of all, I would like to express my uh, pleasure to be uh, discussing to discuss this uh, very important and interesting study. Um, uh, the, f the first thing I would like to clarify is, uh, so this uh, sales restriction policy is only uh, for the local stores, right? In-person transaction, I mean. Um, if I'm understanding your question correctly, are you asking if it's for for the store, if the policy is, is for yeah. the re tobacco retailer? Yes. Uh, Okay, so I just want want to know in California, do you happen to know uh, the proportion of the high schoolers, how, how many of them uh, purchase uh, the e-cigarettes online? Um, my thought is uh, if many of them purchase uh, uh, e-cigarettes online, so if we have this data, maybe we have some uh, expectation uh, uh, how wh what kind of magnitude of the effects we can identify through this uh, uh, study? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't have those numbers just um, on the top of my head, but there are um, uh, resources. The, um, the California Youth Tobacco Survey uh, collects this data on on where youth purchase their tobacco products. And so that, that's where I would go to, to find out this information. Um, but yeah, but definitely youth are purchasing e-cigarettes from a variety of sources, including online, um, through their friends, through retail stores. Um, yeah, so, it's, so yeah, there are a variety of different sources and um, that's, I think that's one place you can go to. <laughs> find the answer. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have it. That's fine. So I just want to have some, uh, 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 maybe we, this information can help us to, to see why the result is like that or something like that. So um, uh, my second question is about, maybe I missed some information. So if so, I apologize. Uh, so during your uh, study period, uh, in your study sample, uh, so you include the nine counties in Bay Area, right? So among those counties, is there any uh, city they already have the uh, uh, the the restriction policy, or uh, are there any cities they change their policy uh, from the last uh, comprehensive uh, one to the uh, comprehensive one during the study period? So. It, if that's the case, so how, how you handle them? So you exclude them or you include them in your study sample? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so during our study period, there weren't any uh, cities that changed their policy. Uh, so we didn't, we weren't concerned about that. Um, I mean, after our study period, I know Oakland, um, during our study period, Oakland had some exemptions, and now they've removed those exemptions, so they're a comprehensive policy. But that didn't happen until after our study period. Okay, thank you. And then uh, the last question is, uh, uh, so I noticed you, you control the school level and the city level uh, variables in the model. Um, I just wonder uh, whether there's any uh, 
available uh, for school level variable available to uh, to to reflect the tobacco control or education program uh, on on the campus um, because I think this uh, information uh, uh, will be associated with the use uh, e-cigarette use right and uh, another thing is I uh, you have the three outcomes and the, one of the outcomes is uh, marijuana in e-cigarette use and uh, uh, California already uh, uh, legalized the recreational marijuana in 2016 I guess right so and opened the market in 2018 uh, January so it's before uh, your policy uh, period but um, but locally actually uh, many of the cities or counties they have quite uh, different marijuana policies in terms of uh, they can control what business they allowed or what kind of the products they allow to sell locally. So I just wonder uh, how, so I think these ones maybe uh, will be have some association with the, at least the outcome of the marijuana use in e-cigarettes. Uh, so do, do you uh, use something to control or uh, so when you uh, construct your modeling uh, so you how you handle those uh, things yeah yeah good questions um so I'll start with the the marijuana question um so so there are different policies for different cities in terms of marijuana sales but we did we did not include that in our model, but it, it is a really interesting question. Um, so it could be, it, I, yeah, I think it would be interesting for future research to see, to look at the variation in marijuana policies um, and if, if that impacts e-cigarette use or, or marijuana use. Um, and then the school question, um, all California public schools, um, don't allow, they ban e-cigarettes. And so, um, so there, there isn't much variation there. It's, uh, all, it's, it's banned from all schools. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we have many questions uh, in the Q&A. So uh, the first one is from Samuel Asa. Um, and the question is, a very similar to uh, Yingling's first question, should we worry about cross-border purchases and online purchases to do check sources of access to uh, flavored tobacco products? I think you already answered uh, about online purchases. Uh, we don't have sources, but what about cross-border shopping? Oh, cross-border. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So cross-border, um, so we have, um, well, California is a really big state. So I think um, it's, it's a little bit harder for some people who live in California to, to cross over. Like I live in Sacramento and um, yeah, there's no way. <laughs> it, it takes you like two or three hours to get to, I guess Nevada would be the closest state. Um, but there's other people, yeah. So there's, um, we didn't take into account cross-border purchasing, but there could be cross-border purchase, purchasing in Nevada or Oregon or even Mexico, which would be international purchasing, I guess. Yeah, I guess uh, um, it would be interesting to see, you know, in Bay Area, whether there is an incentive uh, on whether it's easy enough for uh, teens to travel. Um, so the next question is uh, from Mike Pascal. Uh, the rate of missing for e-cigarette use seems high, around 15%. Any idea why that may be the case? Did you test using missing e-cigarette use as an outcome to see if that's systematically related to flavored policy adoption? Um, let's see. So uh, uh, did you say that the percent with e-cigarette use seems high? The missing value, the missing of e-cigarette use. Remember you showed a, a chart, uh, a flow chart, where you dropped the uh, observations. 
and、ah. uh, there is missing e-cigarette use, and it seems quite high. So Mike's question is about: Do you have any idea why that may be the case? And then, um, yeah, missing missing data. So、uh, you can see, so attend public high school, and then you drop those missing with、uh, observations with missing data on e-cigarette use. Uh, so I think you dropped about twenty thousand observations there. So did you test using that missing e-cigarette use as outcome to see whether there is any systematic difference related to the flavor policy adoption? That's Max's question. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I'm not quite sure why there's、uh, so many who are missing. It could be because students don't want to.、Um, They don't want to report on their e-cigarette use because、um, they know they're not supposed to be using. Or,、um, and no, we did not.、Um, we did not test for the the missing category, but that's a、um, that's a good idea, and、uh, we can do that in future research. Thank you.、Um, so the next question is from Darcy Ruff. Do the flavor restrictions include only in-person sales, or do they also include online sales? So, in the the law that's written, is it also forbidding online sales? It's in-person sales. So they these、um, flavor restrictions are at the tobacco retail level.、Uh, so it it does not include online sales.、Yeah. Thanks.、Um, Thank you for the clarification. So the next question is from Christian Sands. Should flavored tobacco bans affect how easily students can obtain electronic cigarettes?、Uh, is this because these bans might include more retailers to sell e-cigarettes? Ah,、uh, uh, we'll say yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just reading the question also.、Um, yeah. So the idea is that、um, that tobacco retailers will not be able to sell flavored tobacco products anymore, and so if students or their friends or their older friends were going into these retailers to get tobacco products, they they wouldn't be able to get them, and therefore it'd be harder for students to get them, and use would decrease. So that's kind of the the idea behind it. I'm、yeah. not sure about the second question. If、um, uh, yeah, I'm also reading it. I think maybe you can contact Christian later after the uh presentation. Um. So the next question is from、uh, Nancy Rigotti. Uh, do the policies also restrict flavored cigarettes? And did you look at the use of cigarettes as an outcome data as well? Yes. So the policies, they,、um, yeah, especially the comprehensive policies, they they ban flavors from from all products, including cigarettes.、Um, and we did look at cigarettes as an outcome. We didn't include it in our paper.、Um, But we did look at cigarettes as an outcome, and、uh, it was very the prevalence was very low, and、um, we did not see an association between flavor bans and cigarette in our when we looked at it.、Um, thank you. The next question is from Samuel again. What's the level of compliance in these jurisdictions jurisdictions that restrict the sales of flavored tobacco products? Yeah, that that's a good question.、Um, Uh, well, we we have some compliance information about San Francisco because it,、uh, that has been published. So in San Francisco, compliance was about eighty、um, percent a year after policy implementation.、Um, but that's that's the only city that I have information on compliance. But it's yeah, that's really useful information, and I wish there was. More information about compliance out there. Yeah, totally agree. Ah,、uh, so one last question in the Q and A from Cheryl Olson. Do you have or know of any data on how these restrictions affect behavior of adults who smoke? 
Yeah, that's a really good question also. Um, let's see, I, I haven't looked at um, the impact of these policies on adults. I'm trying to, but I think others have, but I am blanking on what they've found right now. Um, yes, I, I think others have, have looked at it and yeah. Yeah, so I think we have uh, very interesting results to uh, follow. So please continue. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for all your questions. Yeah, so this just shows characteristics of some of the cities with and without a flavor ban. And so first we see with and then without. So the, the number of students, so there were uh, fewer students um, with a flavor ban, the number of cities, the number of high schools, uh, and then at the city level, the median population, land area, and number of tobacco retailers. So we can see that um, in these areas with a flavor ban, it's a, it's a more urban area. So it's, um, you know, the, the population density is higher and there's more tobacco retailers. Okay, so I'm going to go through a series of charts for each outcome. Uh, there are a series of tables. They're all, they're all going to look like this one. Uh, so first we have current e-cigarette use, and we have a row for um, uh, students exposed to a flavored tobacco sales restriction and unexposed, and the first percent is pre-policy, the second is post-policy, and then we look at the adjusted odds ratio comparing the pre-policy to post-policy odds, and then we have the difference in difference adjusted odds ratio, comparing the odds ratio um, for flavored tobacco sales restrictions to not having a flavored tobacco sales restriction. So here we can see if we look at the percentages that going from pre to post policy, for both students exposed and unexposed, there wasn't a lot of change um, in the percent who used e-cigarettes. Um, and neither of these odds ratios were significant. And then the adjusted difference in difference odds ratio was also not significant, indicating that there's no association between labor tobacco sales restrictions and current e-cigarette use. Next, uh, this is a table among current users. We're looking at uh, frequent e-cigarette use. And we see that um, frequent e-cigarette use uh, increased slightly in both groups from pre to post policy. And the odds ratio for the unexposed group was uh, statistically significant. Uh, but we see that um, the, the increase was similar for both groups. So the adjusted difference in difference odds ratio was very close to one. And uh, we did not see a significant association between ex uh, flavored tobacco sales restrictions and frequent e-cigarette use. Next, we have ever e-cigarette use. So if we look at these percentages, they're uh, very similar pre and post policy for both groups. There's very little change over time. And that's reflected in the odds ratios and the difference in difference odds ratio. So again, we see no association between flavor tobacco sales restrictions and ever e-cigarette use. And here we have the outcome of ever used marijuana in an e-cigarette. So we see there was an increase in ever using marijuana in an e-cigarette for both exposure groups from pre-policy to post-policy. And the odds ratios were um, significant, uh, but the increase was similar for both groups. So the adjusted difference in difference odds ratio was close to one. 
So again, no significant association between flavor policies and ever using marijuana in an e-cigarette. And then we have uh, whether or not it was easy to obtain e-cigarettes. And we see it increases for both groups. So even among students exposed to a flavored tobacco sales restriction, uh, pre to post policy, there was an increase in um, you know, the percent of students who reported that it was easy to obtain e-cigarettes. And this was statistically significant and a similar increase um, in unexposed students. And again, the odds ratio was close to one. So we did not find an association between flavor bans and access to e-cigarettes. And I forgot to mention, we uh, adjusted for the following factors listed down below in each analysis. And then for our sensitivity analysis, where we looked at the two different exposure groups, they were consistent with the main results. So uh, just to summarize what we found, we did not find an association between flavored tobacco sales restrictions and e-cigarette use one year post-implementation in the Bay Area. We found an overall increase in ease of access to e-cigarettes and using marijuana in an e-cigarette. And um, we just want to point out that flavored tobacco sales restrictions are just one part of a broader plan to reduce youth e-cigarette use. Uh, and this broader plan um, includes e-cigarette inclusive smoke policies, media campaigns, education programs, and cessation tools targeted to you. So it's just one tool, uh, and, it, and they need to be part of um, a broader plan. So some of the limitations of our analysis is that we didn't have information specific to flavored e-cigarette use. The questions just asked about any e-cigarette use. The most youth do use flavored products. And then we had the, we did not have the, um, the city where the students lived. We had the city where they attended school, which may be different. Uh, but we did include, uh, we only included public schools, which are uh, more likely to, students are more likely to live and attend school in the same city. And we only included seven cities uh, with flavor regulations, and they were all in the Bay Area. So a very small, you know, number of cities and all within a, one region of California. So now we'll uh, go into a little bit about, you know, why did we not see an association? The youth um, could be traveling to nearby cities to obtain flavor products. For example, in Oakland here, there's uh, nearby cities that do not have a flavor ban. Uh, we have here in this city, there's, um, you know, in Sonoma, there's, it's surrounded by cities without a flavor ban policy. Uh, I think like was mentioned earlier, you could be obtaining these products um, online through websites or social media. Uh, another reason youth may not be complying or retail stores may not be complying with these policies. Um, from published literature, we know that uh, about 20% of retail stores in San Francisco did not comply, but we don't know about the other cities. And there's a possibility for substitution. So it's possible that uh, students may be switching to flavored marijuana products if flavored e-cigarettes are no longer available. Uh, there was a study that looked at um, high school students in Northern and Central California and found that 58% of those who smoked marijuana in, in an e-cigarette used a flavored product. So this is a, could be a possibility. 
And then now I'll talk about some of the next steps. So we plan to stratify our results by tobacco retailer density. Um, I received the TRDRP new investigator, investigator grant to continue this research, looking at more flavored policies in California and an extended follow-up time beyond one year. And uh, UC Davis has a new tobacco cessation policy center where we also plan to uh, look at the impact of flavor bans and particularly the, the, the state level flavor ban and um, e-cigarette use. And I just like to acknowledge um, most of this work was done um, when I was a, a KL2 scholar. Um, so my, my mentors and co-authors and the leadership of the program, uh, Mark Meany from the Public Health Law Center was very helpful in obtaining the uh, information on the different policies and the dates. And Ben Frigg from the California Healthy Kids Survey. So thank you. That's, that's all I have. Thank, thank you, Dr. Dahl. Very interesting results. Uh, audience, if you have any, any questions, please put them into Q&A. We'd like to hear your feedback. Uh, so let's first attend to our discussion, uh, Dr. Yiming Wang. Uh, Hi, that's a, a very interesting result. Um, I just uh, uh, just wonder, because we didn't identify any significant results for the e-cigarette use, and I noticed uh, seven cities, among seven cities, four of them actually implemented uh, the policy after 2019, right? So our, uh, the data, the survey we, we pull is uh, 2017, 18, and 1920. So we only have very short post-policy period, but among seven cities, three of them actually they implemented the policy uh, before the 2019, although uh, their policy are not comprehensive one. So I just wonder, did you ever try to use some uh, categorical uh, policy exposure uh, variables? For example, uh, two types of the policy, comprehensive one and the last comprehensive one. And uh, then the reference group is the unexposed one. And then we can compare uh, each type of the policy versus the unexposed one. And also we can compare two types of the policy to see uh, whether there are some different impacts on the, the outcomes. Uh, so that's one of the, my thoughts, but I don't know, maybe you already did such a exercise and uh, I don't know how, how much difference would, would, would make. Right, right. We did look at it um, with three categories. We were also getting into some uh, small sample sizes as well, which is, I think, why we ended up using two categories. But I like, um, yeah, I like that. Uh, way of categorizing them as, um, you know, comprehensive and then policies with exemptions and then compared to no policies. Uh, yeah, I think the sample size is also, always the issue for yeah. the secondary data analysis. Uh, um, my second uh, comment is uh, since, uh, so the second outcome is uh, marijuana uh, in e-cigarette use, uh, uh, we we also couldn't identify the significant result. So I just uh, and you mentioned that it could be the substitution between the flavored e-cigarettes and the uh, uh, flavored marijuana. And then I just wonder, did you uh, try to uh, uh, do the analysis on the current uh, marijuana use? I think because this outcome will have the broader group over there maybe will help us to identify significant results. Right, so I looked at um, ever used marijuana in an e-cigarette, but I haven't looked at um, just overall marijuana use, which is available as ever used marijuana or current use of marijuana. So I haven't looked at those outcomes yet, but that's that's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my last comment is uh, is uh, uh, for the third outcome. So uh, the third outcome is access to the e-cigarettes. 
And so for this survey, they ask all the students about uh, what do you think a uh, uh, student in your grade, uh, uh, how easy it is to, to get the uh, e-cigarettes, right? And But for the e-cigarette users, actually we have the average user, current user, and the frequent users. And the different uh, uh, frequency of the use will uh, in, have some uh, impacts on their demand, right? So I just think, uh, did you ever try to do this analysis uh, among the frequent e-cigarette users? Uh, because I think the frequent e-cigarette users, they have to, they use the e-cigarettes at least 20 days in, in a month, means they have a higher demand than they, this group of people could have the higher probability to go to the local uh, stores to, to purchase the e-cigarettes, right? Compared to the rest of the group. Then maybe it could help us to identify some significant result on this uh, uh, outcome, which is uh, access to the e-cigarettes. So, so I, maybe you already did this uh, analysis. I don't know whether it make any difference or not. No, I, I haven't done it yet, but that that's a great idea. It it makes um yeah, it I, I can see the logic where um right, the frequent users are going to be more likely to be accessing um e-cigarettes. And so yeah, I think that's a great idea and we can do that in the future. Okay, thank you. I, that's all I have. And uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, Yingning. Um, so we have some questions in the Q&A. Uh, the first is from Robin Kipk. Um, the question is, once the statewide policy passed, did you look at any variant, variance between teen use in urban counties and rural counties? Um, I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Yeah, so this is about... Uh, I think this is probably about a future uh, research uh, idea because uh, this is asking about the statewide policy passed. You know, once the statewide policy passed in California, I don't think you it has to examine that policy, right? Not statewide, just Not like statewide. local. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just local. Yeah. But did you look at any variance between teen use in urban counties and rural counties? So, like disparities. Uh, in e-cigarette use by rural urban residents? Right, that's a good question. Um, let's see, we did adjust for population density, um, but I did not, we didn't specifically look at differences in e-cigarette use by population density um, uh, in a, in a, in a follow-up analysis, we, we stratified our results by tobacco retailer density. Um, and that paper will be coming out soon. Yeah, look, look, look forward to reading your new paper. Um, so the next question is from Samuel again. Um, so the question is, um, I think you use more than one year of data in the pre-policy period to show the parallel trends assumption. Why use only one year of survey in the pre-policy period for the analysis? So you compare, you know, one year before the policy, one year after policy, why not expanding your study period to look at pre more years in pre-trend? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. Um, right, we did have more years some of our outcomes um, weren't available to, until the 1718 survey. So marijuana use and access to e-cigarettes wasn't available until 1718. So that's one reason why we um, didn't include most years. Um, and then another reason is because uh, we were looking at the same high schools over time and it would have been um, harder to, to get the same high school over time if we had included more years. So I guess it was a trade-off, um, you know, include more years 
or look at the same high school before and after the policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thank you. So the next question is uh, from Christian. Um, Sans, um, could you break down the results by below 16, above 16, to see if ability to drive is important? especially if people are able to drive to nearby locality or locality of residence is least measured. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. Um, we did not look at that, um, but uh, something to consider for the future. Yeah, that, that's going to be interesting to see. Um, so we have actually two questions from Mike Pisco. The first question I think is very similar to what Ying asked about uh, looking at the uh, frequent e-cigarette use. Uh, the second question is, uh, since your results suggest e-cigarette flavor restrictions do not impact use e-cigarette use, should the conclusion be that your results suggest that flavor restrictions are not an effective policy for reducing uh, use e-cigarette use? No, no. that that. It's not our conclusion. So I would like to emphasize this last bullet point here that even though we we did not find an association, um, it, it doesn't mean that they're not effective. So other people have found that they're effective looking at different states, different areas. Um, so we just looked at one very you know small area of California. Uh, and we only looked at one year post implementation. So maybe it, it takes a longer time for these policies to have an impact. Um, so we think that they're part of a plan to kind of change social norms around e-cigarette use. And this plan would include, you know, removing access to flavored e-cigarettes, you know, creating e-cigarette smoke-free policies, having media campaigns that portray the dangers of e-cigarette use, uh, education programs also, and then specific cessation tools targeted to you. So if you do want to quit, they have these tools available for them. Thank you. Um, so I have a question regarding the um, post policy period because it was 2019 and to 2020. So the question would be like, you know, it's during COVID. So many things changed during that period. So I'm wondering, um, so if if that means um, the prevalence may change, the trend may change due to, you know, lockdowns um, and other factors that happened during the time. Yeah, we, we, um, we, asked this question of the, the survey administrators and they said that I mean most of the data from 1920 was collected before um, you know before the school lockdowns so we have um, you know it, so the data is collected in two terms mm. um, some schools collect the data in the spring and some collect it in the fall so fall of 2019 was you know pretty um, you know school was still going on um, there weren't a whole lot of concerns and then in spring 2019 is spring 2020 is when the school shutdowns happened um, but most of the data was collected before these shutdowns happened. Um, thank you. Uh, so another question from Robin. Uh, so. Uh, the question is about does the statewide law uh, ban online sales in and the delivery to California addresses? So the question again is about online sales. So do you know if the statewide law uh, restrictions that you mentioned in the talk also ban the delivery from other states to online sales to California addresses? Mm -hmm. Right, that's a good question. Um, so, I believe that the 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 state policy only applies to retailers. Um, the retailers are not allowed to sell these flavored products anymore. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm not very familiar with the online sales laws, but I do. I have heard 
accounts where online sales are happening in California. Um, and I, yeah, I, yeah, it would be interest, interesting to do future research studies, looking at these online sales and, um, you know, researching, you know, what are the online policies and the delivery policies. And I think that's a really important area for future research. Yeah, I totally agree. Because uh, I think in one of your slides, you also show that they, re, uh, I guess, you reported their uh, the easiness of getting uh, e-cigarette products, and it actually went up uh, mm -hmm. in 2019 to 2020. So it would be interesting to know whether it's uh, cross-border shopping, uh, they, they drive somewhere to buy, or you know they get online sales, <laughs> uh, purchase products online. So uh, that would be very interesting to study. I don't mm -hmm. see any additional questions in the Q&A, so um, I'm going to let uh, our MC Stephanie to take us out. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Si. We're out of time now. However, if you still have burning questions or thoughts for Dr. Dove, you can join us for Top of the Tops, an interactive group discussion offered immediately following select Tops events this season. To join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat and switch rooms with us once this event concludes. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of uh, approximately 85 people um, for your participation. Have a top-notch weekend. <laughs>